Thank you for listening and supporting The Daily Memphian. Sign up for one of our many free newsletters and breaking news alerts at dailymemphian.com slash email to receive the latest local news stories impacting our community. Our weekly newsletters cover everything from sports to arts and culture, business, food, and more, along with daily updates of all the news we publish each day. Sign up or manage your email preferences at dailymemphian.com slash email. Welcome back to another edition of the Daily Memphians Memphis Grizzlies podcast. This is your host, Grizzlies beat writer Drew Hill, joined as always by columnist Chris Harrington. The Grizzlies on an 11 game win streak. They have tied the franchise record that mostly the same team set just a season ago. Um, they took down the Cleveland Cavaliers on Wednesday night at FedEx Forum, win by one point. Very, very close game. Uh, comes down to the final seconds. First close game we've had in a really long time, actually. And an incredibly enjoyable basketball game just to be in the building and watch. I thought both teams played at a very high level. Um, but the Grizzlies pull it out at the end. Dylan Brooks gets the stop. And um, Jaron gets the stop before that. Steve-O scores the game winner. So much to take away from that game. But when you walked out of the arena on Wednesday night, Chris, what was going through your head after watching that? I mean, it, it felt like everyone was having the same thoughts at the same time. I I later discovered. I mean, I, I was sitting, you know, two seats from Brevin Knight there during the game, but I can't hear him talk during the game in terms of the broadcast. So then I went back and watched clips, and he's saying, "This is what playoff basketball is like," and that's what I had already written, you know, in my notes. And then you go back to the locker room and Taylor Jenkins, or to the post game media thing and Taylor Jenkins as I described it it felt like he was still vibrating when he was sitting there <laughs> yeah and he was still like you know and he even said outright you know we needed this game it was good for us to play a game like this and I agree with all of this I, I think it had been relatively easy in this in this stretch double digit wins against not very good competition and this was they, they have not played a lot of close games they particularly not played a lot of close games recently I looked at it for the mailbag column I, I, I did yesterday. And prior to that game against Cleveland, they had played, I think, eight games on the season with a final spread of five points or fewer. Only two of those had happened since Thanksgiving. They were all early in the season. So we hadn't gotten a lot of close games, close, tight games against really good teams. And that was one of them. And it was a reminder, I think, for the players, for the coaches, for the fans. Yep. Like, this is what playoff basketball felt like. Couple things. One, I love the Taylor Jenkins line where he gets in there and he's kind of like making opening remarks almost. And he talks for a solid, what felt like three or four minutes. Right. And he just goes, I just said a lot of stuff, but there is a lot of stuff that happened in that game. 100%. That w- never has a truer statement yeah. ever been spoken than, than what he said there at the end. And I just thought it was great, and it was kind of a great way. And I know you used it in the game story. It was right. like it was just a great way to sort of wrap it all up because he's totally right. So much stuff, and that gives us a lot to talk about. Um, and we're recording this on Friday. They'll play the Lakers later on tonight, so we'll have even more to talk about soon. Uh, and then the other thing was, in a way, I was kind of glad that the Grizzlies won because – I was seeing a lot of on Twitter of like, gosh, they got to be better at defending the three point line and they don't have Donovan Mitchell. This is a game the Grizzlies should win. And I just wanted to yell out, stop it. Like the right. Cavs are playing incredible they in really this were. game. Everybody else not named Donovan Mitchell showed up. They played great. I felt like all night long. Uh, they had the 120, 20 to 0 run that the Grizzlies had where they fell behind. But other than that, everybody else on Cleveland showed up. Lavert showed up. Garland was great. So, like, that was just a high-level basketball game. Yeah. And if Donovan Mitchell was playing in that game, maybe the guys that, you know, that did play so well aren't getting as many shots or, or whatever else. And so, you know, I, I just – it was so fun to watch, and I just kept coming back to it, it was, uh, telling myself, like, man, this is just such a joy. And, I mean, there – again, there's just so much that, that happens, but it felt appropriate in a couple of different ways that – the two best defenses in the NBA, you know, 
the the Cavs actually force a miss out of jaw on the potential game winning try and Steven Adams, who you know, I've been saying the most underappreciated Grizzly, and I, I'm getting that from Ja Morant because that's what Ja Morant says all the time. Um, and I don't think it's by Grizzlies fans. I think Grizzlies fans definitely appreciate Steve O and and uh you know, he's pretty universally beloved by everybody. But when people talk about the Memphis Grizzlies, especially national media, they're not mentioning Steven Adams. And for him to get the game winner was great. For Jaron to show off the defense and get not one but two stops on Garland at the end that forced the five seconds and gave them that chance. And then Dylan, I mean, he didn't play a great game, I didn't think, until that final possession. Right. And he makes the one play and it makes you forget about everything else. And so, um, you know, I, there was just so much so much to take away. Um, but is there one thing that sort of stands out uh, on I think, the basketball court? I think the underappreciated, talking about Steve Adams, underappreciated player, I think underappreciated moment of that game, and I was I was going through actually looking. Wait, can one. I guess? Can can this be trivia? Can I guess what you're going to say? Yeah. I think it, it was the clear out on the jaw layup late in that game that like got the Grizzlies back in it or gave them a lead. Oh no! I mean that was good. Okay. Yeah, and, and there was actually that was, that was my prediction. A, there was actually a play earlier in the first half where Brandon Clark did the same thing effectively. And it's like, oh, we're all learning from Stephen Adams, you know. It's like yeah. that we're doing this now. Um, I, and I say this because I was going through this morning. I was going through the the Grizzlies' own Twitter feed, pulling some clips for potential later use. Want to you know do that before there's another game that happens tonight. And the one thing, like one play, not highlighted at least not highlighted well, was that Jaron defensive possession the next to last defensive possession right you, the the, the, yeah. the dylan block on the last but you know the the, the key thing about jared's defensive player of the year um campaign is what he has done as sort of a help defender they they intentionally play him not on top scores when they can get away with it so he can roam and disrupt and everything the Cavs hunted him God, it, it wasn't like, you know, he's guarding one-on-one against a guy like him. He's guarding Darius Garland, an all-star guard who been torching the Grizzlies all night. A little 6-1, 6-2, you know, deadly scorer. They get him on a switch. The Cavs like, hunt him to get him on a switch and to get Garland against him. He's on an island against this dude. Tracks him. Contests the three. It's a miss. They get the rebound. Then they get him on the island again. And he sticks with them for like the entire possession all the way to the rim for the block. And to me, that was like when you're making your defensive player of the year case for Jaron, he got all the numbers and all the, the the blocks and the steals and the playmaking stuff and all of that, which is overwhelming. Put that video right with it to say this dude can guard one on one against almost anybody in the league. Yeah. No, one, one through five. Yes. Seriously, one like, through five. You know, you're not going to do that all, all game, but he can if you get a switch. There's no, there's no one's getting a switch on Jaron and like ah oh, we got a mismatch we can attack this like that that's you know no matter who you are yeah um and then did you think that was a case also for closing Stevo like the the fact that he got the rebound and put it back at the end because we we've talked about well, whether or not they want to truly close well the Steve-O Cavs are not I mean the Cavs are in the in some ways the Cavs and the Grizzlies are sort of doppelgangers of each other in that they both play enormous centers Jared Allen and Stephen Adams. They both play enormous sort of pterodactyl power forwards that drive their elite defense and Evan Mobley and Jared Jackson. And not in this game, although Karis LeVert did a pretty good standing job, so maybe in this game. They both have dynamic backcourts back with two different dudes who can go off. And so, the you know, the difference is that the Grizzlies have good have much better small forwards to play with than the Cleveland does. But other than that, they're very similarly constructed teams. And so that's not the kind of team, you know, one of my, one of my mailbag questions was um, – you know, break down a Grizzlies Nuggets playoff matchup. And I, I'll do that in full when the time comes. But I did three paragraphs on it in the mailbag. And like N- Nikola Jokic, I would worry doing to Steven Adams what Carl Anthony Towns did to Steven Adams in the playoffs. Jared Allen's not doing that, you know? Right. Yeah. No, that's true. Um, that's a good, good way of putting it. So 11 games in a row. As you mentioned, a lot of it came against inferior opponents. Um, but this this one was impressive. They need right. to go to the Lakers for a chance to make franchise history again, second straight year. Um, I, what was it? Prior to the 11 last year, it was nine was the longest? I think it was eight. Might have been I eight. don't think there had been I, – I did I did do this at some point a couple weeks ago. Now I can't remember. But I don't think – I don't think there had been – I think that, that 11 was the only one more than eight, I think. Yeah. So I was doing some thinking on the way down here. Uh, to the office today. 
And I was trying to differentiate between the two streaks because this one felt a lot more nonchalant. And I'm wondering if it's because of the competition that they played. Like, yeah, you were supposed to win a lot of those games and you just took care of business. And so that's why it feels nonchalant. And then I was thinking about it too. And I was like, you know, last year they were winning those, they went on that 11 game win streak and that was middle of COVID bunch of guys were going out and people were playing without stars. Um, and the Grizzlies were just flexing their depth on everybody at that right. point. What do you think? What's the difference here? I don't, honestly, I'd have to go back and research to try to remember the, I'm, I'm looking at it right now, but even glancing at the games, I don't like remember, this is partly like things run together. I, like I, I can construct, you know, Major League Baseball lineup from 1984 better than I can from, from five years ago. Um, I, I don't remember the games. I have to go back and look. I, I, I guess my instinct would say it's, it's always less of a thing when you do it a second time in a row, you know? Yeah. And, and so that's part of it. And last year it was kind of the ascension to the top of the conference. Right. And this year that was kind of the expectation and the Grizzlies were already positioned towards the top of the conference when they started. No, that's a good streak. point. They were 19 and 14 when the streak started last year. And this year, as I try to move move my fingers quickly on the keyboard, um, they were 19 and 14 last year when the streak started. This year, they were 20 and 13. So not a big difference, really. Only one game better. But last year, you also had Phoenix running away with the conference in the regular season. Yeah. So they were not they were not in contention for the number one seed in the West, like at any point last year, really, because Phoenix sort of ran away with it. So the competitive context is a little bit different this season, too. Um, I was going to save this for later, but now that we're here talking about standings and whatnot, let's just, let's go, go to it. Um, Denver, Memphis, two best teams in the West, clearly. Yeah. I mean, clearly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we'll see, you know, I, I still will put asterisks on Golden State and say, because their starting lineup, if you look at starting lineup data, like the best starting lineups this season, Golden State is either first or second there. They're there with Denver and Memphis and, and Boston in terms of the most effective starting lineups. And so, like, you know, in theory, like, if they're healthy when the playoffs start, you just stop playing some of these young dudes and, like, just go with your guys. I, I Like, they could be with them. But over the course of the regular season, it's not close. I mean, Memphis and Denver have really separated themselves. Yeah. And the makeup of those two teams is kind of interesting to me. Like, the makeup of Memphis versus the makeup of Denver because yeah. – it is a little bit different. I mean, the, Denver does have, obviously, Jokic, and he's playing probably the best season of his career. He's got a really good chance of winning MVP for the third straight season. Nuggets sent me a Nikola Jokic poster to oh. campaign for uh, Jokic three years in a row here. Um, but I, I was asked a question on the radio the other day, how do I think that those two teams sort of stack up against each other? And they both have like the dynamic scoring guard. Jokic is does something though I think different than Memphis has. I mean, Stephen Adams is a good passer and a good rebounder, but right. you know he's he's not doing the things that Jokic is is doing. Um, and then you do have Jaron that you can put on him, but you're kind of taking away some of Jaron's strengths if you were to put Jaron on Jokic. So uh, it is a, it's an interesting dynamic I think between those two teams. I you know Denver has they're going to play each other. Twice in the mat in, in a week, February twenty fifth. We get we had we had a month to wait on it, but they're going to play each other February twenty fifth in Memphis, and then March third on ESPN in Denver. And if they're both still the top two teams in the West, and I assume that they will be, those are going to be really interesting games to watch. Um, they played each other once early. That was earlier in the season. Um, I mean, it's going to it would be a fascinating matchup in the playoffs in part because on one end of the floor would be particularly fascinating because Denver is the number one offense and Memphis is the number one defense. And so, like the you know, flip it around, that stuff matters too. But the spotlight's really going to be on how how the Memphis defense deals with the Denver offense. And the point I made in the mailbag question about this is, the Grizzlies have the best defense in the NBA, but it's predicated on sort of unusual matchups. They don't just line up most games like position to position, or one against your one, or two against your two. They they they, they put they try to find the best score to put Dylan Brooks on, and the best player to hide John Morant on, and then the best player left. That Jaron can guard but cannot pay full attention to, so we can roam and, and, and contest everything else. And so it's this puzzle thing. And Denver is the best offense in the NBA, and they have the center Nikola Jokic, and it makes it like a hard yeah. thing. You can't put Dylan Brooks on their best score because that's Nikola Jokic, right? You probably that's the one thing he doesn't really do is guard guys that huge. And so you put Stephen Adams on him. Well, 
is he going to pull Steven Adams all the way to the three point line like Towns did? And like, and then did you go small? And if you put Jared, it's 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 a chess match, and it's one Grizzlies might win, but it's gonna it's gonna be a challenge. Um, you've also written about the trade deadline, yeah, which is approaching. Um, wh- how do you view their their current situation? To me, it all sort of it stems from Danny Green. Like, what what do they think Danny Green yeah. is going to be? It's and it's kind of hard to know without them outright saying it. How I mean, they've they've said that they like Danny Green, but it, it's really hard to I guess get a grasp of and and, and see the di- a, a direction that they may go. But it all sort of centers around him, right? Yeah, so I wrote a trade column, I don't know, a week last week maybe. Maybe it was last week. I can't remember anymore. I think it was last week. I didn't do any trade questions in the mailbag. I I saved them and maybe I'll get I'll get back into it a little bit next week. I don't I don't think the Grizzlies are gonna do anything. I, I'd put the odds at below twenty percent that they do anything. Um as far as Danny Green, I mean my sense I, he was out there before the before the last game, like doing workouts with, you know, I think it was Kennedy Chandler and like, you know, there's some of the other, you know, younger guys. He's been doing five on five. Um, I think that their expectation is he's going to play for them. Um, I think they love him even if he doesn't play for them. So I don't think it's not just they value even if he doesn't play, they value him as more as more than an expiring contract there to be traded. And so which is not to say they would not trade him, yeah. but they do put value on his presence, period. And I think they think he's going to play. I I think they're not going to do anything. Um the one thing I would look at, like the deals, the deals I've thrown out about using hit, using the Danny Green expiring for a Malik Beasley or Alec Burks, I don't think they're going to do anything like that. I think I might, but I don't think they will. The one thing I'd keep an eye on, I think OJ Ananobi is going to get traded, and I think if he gets traded, I, I this is not reporting. This is just assumption. Either the Grizzlies, if he's available, either the Grizzlies already have or will have conversations with Toronto about him, along with fifteen other teams, mm-hmm. right? I think he's going to get moved, and if the if the price gets low enough, it wouldn't shock me if they actually did something kind of big with that. If I had to predict, I think he's going to go to like Sacramento or New Orleans or somewhere else, actually in the West, because um, the latest reporting on that is like you know they want players, and who knows if this reporting is accurate, but the latest reporting is you know they want players under contract of value going forward, like along with some draft stuff. Instead of like we want like seventeen draft picks or whatever, like we want good players and we want the draft pick. Well, Zaire Williams fits that mold. So does Keegan Murray from Sacramento. And so does, if you look at New Orleans, they got Herb Jones and Trey Murphy and Dyson Daniels. What if you put two of those guys with a draft pick, right? I feel like those teams may have a better a better blend of what Toronto is looking for and also more willingness to throw a lot at them than I think the Grizzlies probably do. Yeah, you, you're probably right about that. What do, what do we make of the Dylan Brooks thing? I mean, we, we were asking, is Dylan going to be on the team post-trade deadline? Will Dylan be with the Grizzlies again next season? He seems to have elevated his value a, a bit, although he's struggled offensively as of late. But My, my sense, I'm going to say this is more than a hunch. I'm going to say this is a sense. My sense is that they have no interest in trading Dylan Brooks. Maybe maybe I'll get shocked by that. But my sense is that's just not even a thing. And so... Because he seemed... I don't know. I can't say this for sure. But I saw something on Twitter. Somebody trying to lip read something about trade who. You're going to trade who after he made the block uh, in the Cavs game. I Now, again, that's somebody lip, lip reading on Unless Twitter. I've caught the wrong vibes. I don't think they have any interest in trading Dylan Brooks. Um, but, but that raised the question about this summer. Because he's, he's going to be an unrestricted free agent. Unless he signs an extension between now and then, which he could, but I don't think he will, he'll be an unrestricted free agent, and that'll put them in kind of a difficult spot because if someone else makes him a big offer and you let him walk, how do you replace him? Like, I, I don't think – I think they really like Zaire Williams. They really like David Roddy. I don't think those guys should be ready next season to replace Dylan Brooks, you know, in full. And at that point, like – you know, I don't know what's I haven't looked at the free agent market, but you're not like you're gonna have tons of money to spend even if Dylan Brooks walks, you know. And so they're in a position where they really need to bring him back. Like, you know, they need a starting small forward next. They're trying to win a title not next this season, but next season. So they need a starting small forward next season. And if it's not Dylan Brooks, I don't know who it's gonna be. And so that's why the the Ananobi thing I do wonder about if he's available because he's under contract next season. And so like, let's say you fl- you did a trade for Ananobi that cost Dylan Brooks. Again, I don't think this is going to happen, but in theoretical matter, well, you would you would be kicking the can down the road one more year. Now, long term, it may be a bigger concern because Ananobi may draw command a bigger contract than Dylan Brooks, and can you pay him and Desmond Bain? 
but that puts puts it off another year. You you would already check your box at small forward for this season and next season, right? And so that's I I wonder if they do anything trade wise if they're looking not just about right now, but like what you know. That's one of the reasons I like the Malik Beasley idea because he's got a, a a team option for next season. It's not just a one year thing. So I think you know they they have to. They have to be thinking about their small forward position, not just right now, but beyond. And if they, and if and and they're going to be in an interesting situation with Dylan Brooks this summer, like if they, if they don't trade him for something that that is now for that has value, that's going to check that box next season, which I don't think is going to happen. Then they have to resign him. I think I don't, you know, I don't know what the what the alternative is. Yeah, and another thing to keep in mind is that. The team likes Dylan Brooks. Like yes. very clearly, you can. We get the chance to be in the locker room after these games. They're talking about going to Dylan's house to hang out. You know, like they they. He is a very well liked teammate on the team as well. And you, for as much as that is made about Grizzlies chemistry, you know. Well, yeah, I think that 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 would probably stir the pot a little bit if if he were to be traded let's look course. at the cleveland game he you know we talk about in fact let's 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 take this to talk about dylan brooks a little bit more and then go beyond dylan brooks i think relative to the trade deadline because there's another point about this game so if you think about this as this is more like a real playoff game than they would played in a long time to your point dylan brooks was not having a good game till the end but like he was 4 12 like he wasn't like you know three of 17 or something right like you know, John Morant took 19 shots. Desmond Bain took 17. Jaron Jackson, 13. Maybe you'd like a little bit more, but 13 with, with four free throws to Dylan Brooks, zero. So probably three or four more actual shot attempts. Dylan Brooks was fourth in the offensive pecking order in that game and then played his ass off on defense at the end of the game, right? <laughs> yeah, so it's yeah. like this idea like that, that he is not accepting a role. It's just not – he is accepting a role when you have all the guys. And so, you know, I, I, I look at that relative to him in terms of he's fitting in just fine. You'd like him to be a little bit more efficient and not go 0 for 5 from 3 in that game. But, like, he's fitting in just fine. But here's what I would I would point out, and this has been the genesis of my sort of trade speculation from the beginning. Like, okay, that was like a real playoff game. Well, Zaire Williams and John Conchar didn't do anything in that playoff game, in, in that playoff light game. Like, they really struggled. They were combined 2 of 7. Um Conchar was on the floor when they had their 20-0 run in the first half, so his plus minus looks good. But late in the game, there were people going, Ugh, we got to get him out of here when like when it really tightened up. Which is not to say that's going to be the case in the playoffs, but I think that is still a question. Are your wings off the bench good enough in the playoffs? And maybe Danny Green helps answer that. But I, I think that that is still a question. Okay, before we take a break, uh, give me one trade that you like. One potential trade that you like. Well, the one the one that I threw out there that sub- subsequently was thrown out. It was funny, like the, the day that I wrote that that trade column that morning, Zach Lowe had a podcast that also went out that morning. So they were both done before they went out. So separately from each other, we both threw out the same trade, which was Malik Beasley. It was it was Danny Green plus you have to throw one other small contract to get it to match. So I suggested Tillman. You could, it could be Conchar. It could be Laravia. So let's say one of those three. So Danny Green, one of those three, and a protected first round pick for Malik for Malik Beasley. And what I like about that is it gives you a third wing off the bench who is proven to play off basketball. Scored twenty points against the Grizzlies in a playoff game last last season. He is he has been the most um, productive in terms of pure volume. He's been the most productive three point shooter off the bench in the NBA this season. He's leading all bench players in threes. And what I like about it, in addition, which I said earlier, is you get a player option for next season. So it's not just a one-year thing. You could have him for next season, too, but then it comes off the books before a Desmond Bain thing kicks in. I would probably do that, but I don't think the Grizzlies would. And so I just, I don't, unless unless the OG and Obi thing comes in at a price, like, low enough for them to be comfortable with, and they don't get outbid by other teams, I don't think anything's going to happen. Okay, so more on the Grizzlies, but first, let's take a break for a message from our sponsor. This is a St. Jude moment. Ashton was a high-level athlete, and in a, an instant, your world flips, and your healthy five-year-old competitive cheerleader has a brain tumor. And the physician was like, your best option is St. Jude. Receiving treatment that was life-saving for our child and knowing that that treatment would be of no cost to us was a huge weight lifted. Learn more at stjude.org. Uh, the All Star voting, the latest round of All Star voting, has come out. It is uh, Ja Morant currently sits in third place among the Western Conference guards. He's got one million nine hundred twenty one two 
921,276 votes. He's behind Luka Doncic by 3 million votes, essentially, and uh, essentially behind Steph Curry by the same amount. It doesn't look like he's going to be an all-star starter this year because it doesn't. he doesn't have a very good chance of beating out either of those two guys. Uh, it also feels like this year, I mean, he has a similar amount of votes that he had a year ago at, at this point, right? but it just hasn't had the same sort of, uh, in my opinion, push this season because right. everybody already knows that John Moran is an all-star. Remember right. last year, we would come in here and we'd almost kind of laugh at everybody that was saying, John Morant, all-star, right. all-star. And it was like, yeah, well, <laughs> duh, right. John Morant, all-star. Yeah. We don't need to be saying this on Twitter. But right. it turns out the the social media push sometimes can help with right. the all-star voting. Um, and so to me, maybe that's the case. But do you, I mean... You, what do you think of the voting? Should he have more votes now that he's an established superstar and atop the West? I mean, I think if I were picking the teams, it'd be him and Luca, given the games Curry's missed and given the success of the Grizzlies. So I think he's deserving to be an be an All Star starter. I think what matters for him is being in the all the All NBA team and getting in and triggering that supermax, which I think you know also is highly likely. But guard play is so strong in the league right now that like you know. If he twists an ankle and missed a month, he might not. He might not make it. And yeah. so, you know, um, to me, that's that's the bigger thing for him, and he's certainly on pace for that as well. Um, but he'll be on the All Star team. He won't be a starter. It's fine. The other thing to watch uh, All Star game related is that the so the All Star game is taking place the seventeenth, eighteenth, nineteenth of February in Salt Lake City. Two weeks before that All Star game, the All Star coach is determined. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so this means that Taylor Jenkins has a chance to potentially be the uh, all-star coach. The Grizzlies, very clearly, the players, very clearly want Taylor Jenkins to coach in the all-star game. It's a tough road because they have a tougher schedule, I think, than the Nuggets, and it felt like they maybe had a chance to gain a game over the Nuggets uh, in the in the last game that they played against the the Timberwolves, but they sort of Timberwolves fell apart at the end and the Nuggets end up winning. Um, Taylor Jenkins, n- not interested in discussing being an all-star coach, uh, but I know he he clearly wants that. He said he's he's been an assistant in, in something like that before. So. Oh, well, probably, probably but Budenholzer, I'm sure. I'm, I wonder if multiple times. It'd be interesting to go back and look at that because I think Budenholzer could have coached it for Atlanta even before Milwaukee. I mean, those teams were so good. All those teams they were they were on. Um, you know, it's an interesting thing that sort of slipped under the radar for me. I really wouldn't think about that until you brought it up a couple of weeks ago. And that, you know, if you talk about the franchise things. That's a box that's never been checked, right? Yeah. Obviously, winning titles, ultimate box, or you know, making the finals, ultimate box, MVP award. Like these are the highest level stuff. But like, you know, they've had a rookie of the year. They've had a defensive player of the year. They've had a sixth man of the year. They've had a coach of the year. They've had a lot of these trappings. They finally won a first division title last season at, at past the point where anyone cared, but it happened. Coaching an All Star game that's never happened. Yeah, I mean that would be cool. Do, do you yeah. think that it? Because the coaches determine the other All Stars. If Taylor the, Jenkins, the coaches in total, not the coaches. Yes, the, the coaches. Yeah. Yes, right. If Taylor Jenkins is the coach of the All Star game, does it give any of the other two guys, Bain or Jackson, a better chance to make the All Star? No, game? I don't think that'll be relevant either way to that. I, I was just looking at that. So Jaron's played twenty eight games now. Um, a lot of the competition of, of those forward spots in the West are guys who miss games, and so Zion's at twenty nine. So he's going to pass Zion before the teams are in terms of games played before you get there. Anthony Davis has only played 25. He's actually played less, fewer games than Jaron at this point. Paul George has played 31, so he's ahead of him. But you you may get into, when you get to your last like front court spot in the West, they may be looking at a bunch of guys who have missed a lot of games. And so it, that may not be as much of a driver. And the fact that the Grizzlies, you know, may be first in the West. Of course, one of the guys who I think should be in the mix is Aaron Gordon for Denver, who's right there with the Grizzlies, and he has not missed a lot of games. Right. But I think, you know, I, th- I think if the Grizzlies get a second All Star, it's more likely to be Jaron the Desmond because of the position, because the, the the guard play in the West is deeper than forwards in the West. Yeah, and I mean, it is a little bit of a shame because if he doesn't get hurt, if he doesn't sprain the toe, if he's putting up the numbers he was putting up prior to that, he's probably an All Star, even with the loaded West in the. He's West right there. Guards. I mean, you think about guards in the West. You know, Curry and Luka are going to start. Ja's going to make the team. So there's three. And most are going to take three more. I think Shea Gill is at, uh, Alexander. Yeah, he's a lock. So that, there's four. Yeah. 
Now you look at Damian Lillard, who's missed games. You look at Devin Booker, who's hurt right now, who's missed games. Darren Fox. Fox. I, yeah. I think Fox is going to make it because the, uh, the the Kings are up to third. Still but Bain spots would, open and but, wild card spots. Yeah, but yeah. Bain would be in that conversation with Fox, with Lillard, with Booker. He would be in that group. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, kind of a bummer for him that he got hurt. Okay, <laughs> a f- couple more things. Uh, and I, I want to come back to Desmond Bain, but we have to talk about Santi. Because I'm telling you, I've been saying this. Santi has more swag than anyone knows about. Truly. He is a trash talker down there (laughs) Um, on the court. Sneaky trash talker down there. In the locker room, he's dealing one-liners and making fun of guys in a fun, playful way. And like he, I think he's more of the Memphis genre than people realize. So last night, one of the weird things that happened last night in the NBA, you know, we, we met, I knew some of them already, but we met a lot of the Minnesota media people during the playoffs last year. And I follow all of them now on Twitter. And last night they were all tweeting about how much, how, how awesome Kyle Anderson is, how much they love Kyle Anderson and all this stuff. I was joking about the Kafka reborn in the Twin Cities. And Kyle Anderson has been playing out of his mind, like putting up these like crazy box score lines for them. And I don't even feel bad about it because we got we got we got Santi Aldama in that spot. And Santi has brought in a different way, but he's brought all of like the quirkiness and the style and the he just brings stuff. Everything. Yeah. And the way that Kyle Anderson had a lot of stuff to his game, Santi Aldama in a different way just has a lot of stuff. And I, I get the same kind of pleasure of watching him and wondering, like, what's this dude going to, like, pull out of his bag? And, this, you know, what what's he going to try out all of a sudden on the floor? I, and the same way, the way I did with slow I mean, we did see the between the legs right. dunk after the whistle, which got the crowd going, which was And fun. he was asked about that in the locker room. And he he sort of admitted, he's like, yeah, I would not have tried that if I if the play hadn't been blown dead. Like, he knew the play had been blown dead. And, that's, and then he, he tried that. He said that if it was still active play, he would not have tried that. <laughs> yeah. Which I say, why not? Go um, for it. I mean, it. like, but he has these stretches, too, where he does things that you just don't really expect. Like, he'll... And for the other thing that I want to mention, every time Jaw makes a highlight pass to him, it feels like he makes the shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time it's a highlight pass to Santi, it feels like Santi makes the shot, which is, first of all, I mean, that you deserve some credit there, because sometimes... Highlights, jaw highlights can get ruined by other guys. Well, he had he had a, he, he had a crazy one to Jaron in the corner, and Jaron missed the shot in that game. Yeah, he did. And then on the other side with Santi, it was le- it was a different kind of. It was where he, he like he almost passed the ball like a like a slow pitch softball, but backwards. it was like a baton pass. Yeah, almost, yeah, yeah. But he just let it roll off of his fingers. Right. Yeah. And then and then Santi caught it. Did one of those things where he doesn't even bring the ball down. He just sort of like flicks it into the basket. But he tries. So he does like stylish stuff, but he just does like more old school kind of stuff all of a sudden that you don't expect. Like in that same game, he had a running lefty hook. Like, okay, fine, do a running lefty hook. And then he had another one in that game where he got a he got a switch on the it may have been Garland or some other smaller guard and just turned around and bully balled him and backed him down, hit with some like dark dark style little, little turnaround jump shot. He just has he has got a menu. He's got a menu of fancy <laughs> stuff. He's got a menu of basic stuff. He's got like a you know, a Chinese restaurant style, like I'll, I'll do number 136 kind of menu in terms of his game. Yeah, he really does. Um, and he's like, I'm telling you, he's just what what you imagine him being. He's not, no. <laughs> if that makes sense. It, he, he's one of the biggest characters in the locker room, too. Well, well, on top the crazy, of being one of the craziest moments, the I think you were the one who asked him, one of the craziest moments all seasons, but he has this reverse dunk, and he, he, I think you asked him about it. We're all standing there, and you expect a player in that moment just to say, like, oh, I don't know, I just, you know, it's instinct, whatever. No. He, 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 it was a deliberate Rudy Fernandez. He's thought about this. It, it's strategic. Yeah. It is his Rudy Fernandez tribute. Yeah. All right, I'm going to put out a call here uh, if anybody is listening. So, I... Once had an exchange with John Conchar. Uh, it was actually earlier this season in Orlando. And I told John, because I was, I was thinking about going to the Fort Wayne basketball game while I was up in Indianapolis working on the Bane feature. And I did go. I haven't written the story yet. I still do want to write it. But John ended up not going to Indianapolis for that game because he got sick. Um, but I, you know, I was talking to him about wearing jorts into games. And he was sitting next to Santi. And he said, I'll wear... How about this? I'll wear jorts into one of the games on the next homestand. And I was like, <laughs> you will? And he was like, yeah. I was like, okay, I'm going to hold you to it, John. 
And so he shows up. He doesn't wear jorts to the first game. And I went up to him after the game, and I was like, we still getting the jorts? And he said, dude, I don't know where they are. I can't find them. <laughs> but there was a second part to this because Santi was doing an interview with uh, a, bu- a lot of H- Hispanic reporters in Orlando, and he did the whole interview in Spanish. Of course, I didn't understand a, th- a word he was saying. Right. He finishes the interview. He's sitting next to John, and I just said, man, I can't believe you said that, just joking with him. And he was like, <laughs> he was like, yeah, whatever. He said, one day, I really want you to just do an interview with me in complete Spanish. And I was like, okay, I'll do the interview in Spanish when John wears the jorts into the game. <laughs> so John never wore the jorts into the game, but I still kind of want to do the interview in Spanish with Santi. I don't speak a lick of Spanish. So if there's a Spanish teacher Grizzlies fan out there that wants to help me put together an interview and uh, with, with Santi Aldama, I'd be happy to conduct an interview in Spanish. I, I bet there's more than, more than a few of those, I'm guessing. Somebody right out there has got to be able to teach me Spanish so that I can do the, uh, do the Spanish interview story with Santi. But yeah, Santi has been incredibly fun to watch. And uh, that that game was a collection of it all. The Cleveland game, definitely yeah. a collection of it all. So Desmond Bain. Desmond Bain, yeah. That was the last You had a we big series to. coming out. I'm, I don't want to oversell may, this. The first part may be out by the time people listen to this, depending on when they're listening. It's Saturday. 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 So um, I don't want to oversell this. I'm extremely excited, though. I'm very, very, very excited about this. Um I did the Jaw series last year. People seemed to enjoy it, which was great. I think this has potential to be better than the Jaw series because I think there's more stuff in it that unless you've very closely followed Desmond Bain's career since high school, you probably don't know about much of it. Right. So you'll I I can guarantee if you're a Grizzlies fan and you've lived in Memphis your whole life and you didn't you you weren't in, in Richmond, Indiana when Desmond Bain was growing up you'll learn a lot of things about Desmond from reading this series. So it's going to be three parts. I think it's going to start on Saturday. Uh, we'll see. I'm not committing to anything yet, but I believe it'll start Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday. Uh, and it was just really cool to get to go do it. And it was fun to go to Jaws hometown last year. And it was, it, they are very different where Des grew up and where Jaw grew up. We we were talking about this before right. the last Grizzlies game. Like there's a difference between Jaws hometown, like, Sumter, South Carolina is a bit of a town, but where Ja technically grew up, Dalzell, South Carolina, it feels almost like it's just off the side of a highway somewhere, yeah. teeny tiny little town. Right. Um, Richmond is a city. It's got, I mean, Des said 30,000. I haven't looked up the exact population, but um, it was cool. I the, the best part about it was, you know, Des did help me get started here, which I was really appreciate, uh, appreciative of that. Uh, with some people I needed to go talk to and and some names and faces to go see while I was in Richmond, and his uh his uncle Uncle Tony Bain, uh, luck I, fortunately for me is a really nice guy and invited me to go over to Desmond's childhood house the uh, night before the game. So he had family I'd say probably thirty thirty five people in his uh, great grandmother's house. Got a chance to go stop in eat pizza with them. They told all kinds of great stories about. You know Desmond's life growing up, and uh, just I I think it'll turn out to be really good. I I hope I can adequately tell the story. I've been bugging Des about it for like literally weeks now, and so I'm sure he's tired of talking to me about all this. You want to like briefly preview like the three parts? So yeah, in terms of how it's broken up. So the first story is the the series. Again, I don't want to commit to it, but I believe it's going to be called Bainville. Um, and the first part of the series will be about Bainville, which is essentially a neighborhood inside of Richmond where his entire, well, not his entire family, but most of his uh, close family that he grew up with has lived. They have like four houses all in the same neighborhood. It's open door policy. They walk in and out of each other's houses. And um, they sort of raise their kids up or their great grandkids or, you know, whoever's raising who um, as a as a village. And right. so it's sort of about his roots, about what he means to uh, Richmond, about what being in that environment did for him and how it sort of shaped him as a, a young basketball player. And then eventually now as an NBA star, it's about what he's done to give back to Richmond Uh sort of their level of appreciation uh, for him. And so I think that, you know, that might be my favorite part of the series is part one. Uh, I think they're all good, but I think part one might be my favorite. Um, And so that, that one will definitely, uh, 
I, I know I'm finished writing that one. So that one hopefully can be out pretty soon. Part two is mostly about his basketball career growing up and just his sports career. Right. There's a great story about him playing middle school football uh, that it leads off with. In the second story, I uh, interviewed his middle school football coach who's uh, in his third bout with cancer and he sort of talks about what what it means to feel like you've, he got to be a small part of Desmond's life. And um, it's also got a lot of interviews with people that were around him in his high school years. Um, and the one tournament that sort of turned things around for him to get him the high major college offers, to get him the chance. And uh, of course, also the story about him uh, being convinced to stay at TCU because at one point in time he got really homesick and wanted to come home. So story number two is is about sports. And then story number three is about his relationship with his great-grandmother who passed away in um, in 2020. Or no, in 2021. And uh, just talks about draft night, sharing that moment with her, what she's meant to him growing up. She raised him from when he was two years old. Talks about his great-grandfather as well. Uh, he was a veteran and really hardworking guy in maintenance. He, uh, according to Desmond's uncle, almost lost his arm um, working at like a maintenance facility on different types of machinery and stuff like that. And uh, just their impact on his life. And I'm not totally finished with that story yet, but um, yeah, it should be really, uh, really good. I'm really excited for everybody to read it. I've worked really hard on it. I've been doing this for like more than a month so. Um, and there's great photos, like uh, they've shared all kinds of great photos right. of Desmond in his early years, pictures of him in third grade, boys and girls club basketball as a football player. And yeah, I mean, it should turn out to be good. I'm very, very excited about it. And, um, I'm, I'm also ready to <laughs> kind of get it out there and be right. done with it. Cause I've been working on it for so long. Yeah. Well, uh, well, I'll give you a teaser before we get out of here. One of the sections in the I believe it is the first one, the Bainville um, story. Since the Grizzlies are playing the Lakers tonight, you, I'm sure you remember the exchange between oh, yeah. Desmond Bain and LeBron James. Those footsteps aren't scaring nobody. I asked about it with people in Richmond, and the uh, his best one of his best friends growing up that I interviewed said. Yeah, there's no LeBron fans in Richmond anymore. <laughs> and it's funny because Richmond is right on the border of Ohio, so you would assume that there are LeBron fans in Richmond. But he said, nope, no no more LeBron fans in Richmond after that exchange. And then I, I was asking Desmond's cousin <laughs> at dinner before the uh, Pacers game about it, and she said, oh, yeah, like if you, if you bring up LeBron James in this household, somebody's going to call him a punk. <laughs> um, she's like, and we know it's just basketball. We don't actually have anything personal against LeBron James, but we don't, we don't play around when it comes to Desmond. So uh, that was just a funny exchange. And I went into a Dick Sporting Goods when I was in Richmond, just randomly. And uh, they did have LeBron James Lakers jerseys in there. They were hidden in the back behind all the Pacers gear. I guess they put them away for good. No more LeBron fans in Richmond. So again, for the third time, just really excited for everybody to read it. And um, I'm looking forward to being done with it. So we may have a podcast. We'll see. I may do a podcast to uh, to accompany it, but uh, that will be decided next week. But anything going on with you? Any food podcast? Any uh, outside of basketball stuff we should touch on? Uh, I got some stuff going on, but we don't need to talk about it here. Some some non hoops, non food stuff. It's a secret. Yeah. A secret. Okay. Be on the lookout for that over at thedailymemphian.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening as always. Uh, you can go read all of our work over at the Daily Memphian. Uh, you can go read the Bane series, Chris's story from the game on Wednesday night against the Cavs. I'll be writing off the Lakers game later tonight, so make sure you go check all of that out. Until next time, for Drew and for Chris, we're out of here. In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place.